Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you back to my channel. I grow cold, cool intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia. Sometimes wish it was Melbourne, Florida, just saying. And I don't have a greenhouse or grow lights or humidifiers, just me growing them indoors or outdoors or they're out of the pool. So, fellow plant lovers, if that sounds of any interest to you, do hit subscribe. I post every week on a Friday, chronicling my ever amateur adventures in trying to figure out what can grow for me well in my climate. And what is before me? I hear you cry, ta-da, Sologeny cristata. Yes, Sologeny cristata has finally burst into bloom for me for the first time. Look at that, there are two no, yes, two flower spikes. And I am very, very excited because this is the first Slogeny I ever bought and it is the last to bloom, so there you go. But before we get carried away about care, which we will go into, let's just understand Slogeny Cristata to start with because that will give us all the clues we need about its care information, its watering, its light, its fertilizing, etc., etc. Okay, so Sologenes as a genus sort of spread all the way from the Himalayas all the way down and across into the Pacific Islands, avoiding Australia, strangely enough. So there are Sologenes species found in New Guinea, which is very, very close geologically and geographically to Australia. And the north of Australia does share species with New, New Guinea. But Sologeny didn't decide to pack their bags and head south. But the ones that really work for me are those Slogenies that grow in the Himalayas. So that is sort of northern India, Nepal, Bhutan, all the way across to Vietnam and sort of down that part of the world. Relatively high altitudes, but very misty, very humid and cold winters. So this is why a lot of orchids that are Himalayan are perfect for me because apart from the misty mountainy bit, we kind of have similar climates. Obviously Melbourne is not mountainous, but we do have cold winters that don't freeze. And it is the relative humidity, the average humidity throughout the year is quite high. So it's not a dry climate, whereas other parts of Australia certainly are, but Melbourne isn't. And we do get sort of misty wet winters, so not dissimilar. And like many orchids, it is an epiphyte, but also described as a lithophyte. And I kind of have a thing for lithophytes, but we'll get to that little detail later on. So in that respect, its care is not dissimilar to many other epiphytic orchids that you will have. So let's start, as Julie Andrews may have said, at the very beginning. As you know, I'm in Melbourne in southeastern Australia and our climate is described as either a wet Mediterranean or a warm temperate climate. We don't have the same zonal systems as you do in the United States, so the comparisons aren't really easy to make. But Melbourne is often compared to a zone nine, but Rachel in Gardening Duenza, who is a fantastic gardening but also orchid channel, is in Southern Ireland and she is also the equivalent to a zone nine in the USA. And although there are lots of crossovers between the sort of plants Rachel can grow and we can grow here, quite different, largely because their summers are much wetter, ours are much hotter, and there you go. That gives you a bit of context. I grow this orchid outdoors all year and in Melbourne, the city of Melbourne, outside of the city, the weather can get slightly different. But in the inner city, we tend very rarely to get two or below zero degrees Celsius, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So it very, very rarely, and certainly not in my experience the last five years, freezes here. So saying, Sologeny cristata does come from areas where it can get to just below zero or 32 Fahrenheit. So not one for frost, but it can take quite cold temperatures. And as mine is outdoors all year, it has certainly taken quite low minimums. And this winter we got down to sort of two degrees uh, Celsius, which is what, 36 Fahrenheit? I mean, pretty close to freezing. No frost, but cold nonetheless. So perfect, perfect orchid if your climate is similar to mine. It can take living outside all year. And in fact, plant lovers, let us just stop right there. Why don't I go and show you exactly where this baby resides? So my Sologenies are all outside. Let's go and have a look. And it is growing out here. So here we are. And ta-da, there is the spot right there. 
So there it is, as you can see, it is just hanging on a metal brackety thing and it's suspended on that trellis. So that is facing due south. Obviously I'm in the Southern hemisphere, so that is the dark side, whereas due north is the bright side over there. But as you can see, polycarbonate roof means that that gets a lot of bright indirect light basically all year, but it's breezy through all sides. So it's very airy, it's quite elevated, quite bright. There you go, loving life. And next to it is Sologeny Janine Banks, which I've made a video about before as well, which also loves the same spot. And as you can see here, it just had a second flower spike, which in fact, um, the last bloom has just dropped off. And just out of curiosity, here is another Sologeny in a hanging basket in the similar same spot. And that is an unchained melody, but it is the Alba form, so the white form. And that one, as you can see, has also got a flower spike. So I will make a video about Unchained Melody when that flower comes out, which might be a couple of months yet. So there you are, you can see it hanging in its sort of native habitat. Now, I guess the other point is, we've talked about minimum temperatures, but what about maximums? Now we can get hot summers here in Melbourne and our temperatures can get to 40 degrees um, Celsius, which is, what is that? It's 105 Fahrenheit, I think, hot, hot, hot. Luckily, that kind of extreme heat doesn't last long here in Melbourne, but our summers are obviously warm. But this orchid can take relatively high temperatures. So our summer maximums will often be around the 30 degree mark, which is the high 80s Fahrenheit. It's fine. But talking of temperature leads us naturally, I guess, to watering, because that is the thing that particularly sort of colder climate orchids need, particularly in a hotter growing environment. So we've spoken about temps, very forgiving, both with a minimum and a maximum. And Rachel in Gardening in Duenza, which in fact is where I heard of Sologenies for the first time. So it's all Rachel's fault that I have quite a few Sologenies in my world. Now, Rachel grows hers in a greenhouse in Southern Ireland. And I think perhaps you might also grow them indoors in winter. So certainly a plant that you could grow indoors if your winter was just a little bit too cold. So the other, I guess, caveat is that when I say that I'm growing mine outdoors, they are, but they are undercover. So nothing gets rained on. So that's very important. So yes, back to the watering. Now, this grows in misty, relatively high altitude forests. So you can imagine there's a lot of airborne moisture. It's very cold, humid, except in summer when it's warm, but you know what I mean? There is a lot of moisture in the air. So that is something to replicate. And this is an orchid that I do mist, although it's outside, I do mist in summer every day. Now in winter, it is generally kind of misty enough or humid enough for me not to really worry about it. But in summer, I certainly missed it or I spray the whole area with a hose. So it's, it's quite saturated and the wood's quite wet around it. So there's plenty of sort of evaporation and humidity around the orchid in summer. But as you can see where it's hanging, quite elevated and quite near to the polycarbonate roof. So it does get quite warm, but it's okay. But now this brings me to the second point about watering. I have read in many uh, an auspicious journal that this orchid likes a dry rest in winter. Plant lovers, Mr. Amateur is here to tell you, I don't think that's true. And in fact, I made a collaborative video with Rachel Gardening and Duenza, which I will link, and we talked about it. And my experience is that Sologeny cristata likes consistent watering all through the year, which includes winter. Now for me, that is quite counterintuitive because watering orchids when they're outdoors and it's quite cold at night in winter is a recipe for disaster because often water will stay in them. You have this cold air, they'll either get rot or some other airborne sort of microbe will nestle in and kill the orchid. So keeping orchids cold and wet is often a really bad choice, <laughs> but, best results I've had are watering it throughout the year. So that's not kind of drenching it and also just being careful to try and not get any water into the, um, the tops of the, the growths, the pseudobulbs and the leaves. So, you know, being sensible about it, but certainly keeping the medium moist, I found. So I would challenge the fact that you're supposed to give this quite a dry rest because I haven't and it has done very well for me. So I guess the next logical thing then is if you're watering it all year, do you feed it all year? And my answer to that would be no. So I don't feed it in the winter. 
in spring and I just made a spring video about my spring tasks, I give it a topical application of a general release fertilizer, which will release over the sort of a six month period of the warmer weather and those capsules are activated by the heat. That's the first thing I do every spring. The second thing I do is during the growing season, so from spring through summer, depending how far we go into autumn with the warm weather, is I will give it a liquid fertilizing and or a liquid tonic. So the fertilizer is something that is quite literally a fertilizer with an NKP value, which will be on the bottle or the packet. A tonic is not a fertilizer, but it's like a biological love cocktail. Um, so you can use worm juice or I use a seaweed based solution and any of those, either the fertilizer or the tonic, I dilute to at least one six, one eighth of what's recommended on the packet or the bottle. Now, Cylogeny cristata, we haven't talked about the name. Cristata apparently comes from the Latin word crista, which means comb, and I'm presuming as in hair comb, or it could be perhaps coxcomb, as in with the male chicken, or who knows actually, and it's supposed to represent the shape of the lip. I don't know, with these taxonomists, to me, it often seems a very long bow with association. But anyway, I guess if you've got to name a hundred species in an afternoon, it does get a little taxing. Now, I did mention that it is also found growing lithophytically in its native environment. And I recently learned a trick that lithophytic plants love, and that is an application of garden lime. Again, it's spring, and one of the things I do every spring, which is in my spring, what do I do in spring video, is I give all my lithophytic orchids a little, depending on the size of the plant, either big or small, dose of garden lime. The reason being, they have, ah, oh, and now I'm gonna forget what it is. I think it's calcium and magnesium is in lime. So a lithophytic plant, apparently, this is the science, when the water hits the rock and it runs down, it leaches out to a minute degree, obviously, calcium and magnesium and other things from the rock. So as that water is running down and it will obviously water lithophytic plants that are sort of growing in little nooks and crevices with a little bit of organic matter generally, they are getting much more calcium and magnesium than epiphytic plants that might live on a tree or a tree fern or terrestrial plants, for example. So a trick that I learned in terms of growing and flowering Dendrobium speciosum, the native Australian large orchid, which is commonly called the Sydney rock orchid, ergo it's a lithophyte, is that a dose of lime once a year will just help the plant's general health and well-being and encourage its blooming. So just learned that about Cristata, spring dose of lime on its way. Next urban myth about Cylogeny cristata, which actually isn't a myth, is that they resent being moved and repotted. Now, who doesn't? <laughs> who doesn't resent being moved and repotted? And I can confirm, plant lovers, that this, I've had this plant for three years, or this is the third year I've had it. This is the first year it's blooms. Now, last year, I think it was producing spikes. And I think plant lovers, I didn't water it enough in winter. So the flower spikes emerge in early winter and it's sort of, they mature throughout winter and it's now literally the first week of spring here in Australia and they have opened. So those flower spikes are emerging in winter. Now, who knows what happened last year, but I had, I think two spikes and they both failed. Hmm. Now, could there have been a sudden rise in temperature? No, we had a La Nina winter, which means it's cold and wet. Um, the only thing I can think of was that I was following the sort of prescribed care, which is keep them dry in winter. And I just don't think it loves it. Anyway, this year it has bloomed for me with two spikes. And I'm hoping next year to get, uh, to get more. And there are three flowers per spike. Um, and I, if you Google it, you will see specimen plants and they're just enormous and they're covered in spikes. So I'm very, very, very keen to see what this one does. So that thing about it resenting being repotted, fair enough, I would as well, means that whatever you pot it in, you've kind of got to commit to the long term. So I've got mine in this sort of odd, tall terracotta pot. And my dream slash wish slash fantasy is that all of that pseudo bulb will just sort of grow over and hang and basically create this dome of Cylogeny cristata pseudobulbs which will burst into flower every spring and the whole thing will look amazing. 
Of course, it will look equally as great in a hanging basket or a wooden basket. Um, or if you're growing them in a pot like me, you can suspend it. And mine is growing in that sort of circular bracket and hanging on a fence. So it's always good to sort of elevate them because they are a plant that tends to grow upwards, i.e. sort of in trees and, and high and not at ground level. So it does need good airflow. And that's always the thing to remember with Sologenes that keep the breeze around them, plant lovers. So if you have a little look at the structure, it is the plant has these really fabulous and huge um, juicy pseudobulbs, which kind of look like um, unripe walnuts, I think, that kind of same size. And the flower spike emerges from the base of a newly matured pseudobulb. But that is also where a new growth, as in a new pseudobulb growth, will emerge. But the new pseudobulb growth will emerge later in spring after the blooming. So if you're getting little spikes coming out of those pseudobulbs in winter, you can assume it is a bloom that's going to mature and flower in spring. And if you get those spikes coming out in spring, you could assume that it's actually vegetative growth and it's next year's pseudobulbs growing out of the plant. So that's the cycle that Cristata tends to follow. And as you can see, the flowers are the most beautiful white. And there are these incredible just touches of yellow in the lip. And once again, they are supposed to be fragrant. And I'm here to tell you, plant lovers, uh, there is a vaguely lemony fragrance, but it's super, super vague. I have read that they are quite fragrant. So I think once again, <laughs> it seems to be my lot with fragrant orchids. I've just got a specimen that isn't fragrant, which would suggest, plant lovers, if you have the chance to buy one, try and perhaps buy it when it's in bloom and you can smell it and see if yours does in fact have fragrance because mine doesn't. So each pseudobulb has two leaves and it's just important to keep that sort of juncture of the leaves and the pseudobulb dry. So I try not to get moisture lurking in there unless it's particularly warm and it's going to evaporate. Obviously in, in summer I just spray the whole thing and it will evaporate so it's not going to damage it. Um, and you'll get a flush of growth every year. So you'll get new bulbs and they just sort of form a tangle and the plant can stay apparently in its potted vessel for years and years and years. You know, most plants you're going to need to refresh the, the medium, but not Cristata. So mine is in here for the long haul. And what is it potted in? It's an epiphyte slash lithophyte. So really whatever loose mix you use in your environment. So for me, it is a medium sized bark with perlite, with charcoal, with a bit of sphagnum moss. I may even have used out of the bag orchid mix for this. I can't remember to be honest. But anyway, whatever it is, we're committed because it's got to stay in this pot for a while. And the only other observation is that this spike hasn't quite fully opened yet and something has been nibbling it. So that's a little bit of a disappointment that, I don't know, some sluggy beast has slithered up and taken a nibble out of the bud while it was still closed. So. As it's growing outside, it is a bit of an occupational hazard having buds nibbled. You can find, and I do use an organic snail pellet, which obviously <laughs> kills the slugs and snails, but it won't kill anything that should eat the slug and snails. So, so the snail killing element isn't going to affect other animals. So if a bird should eat the dead snail and slug or a rodent or even a dog, it's not gonna be affected and um, suffer because of that toxin. So. Plants that you're growing outdoors, the buds are susceptible to slug and snail attack. And I have had my Sarcocarlus hartmannii last year, at least half of the flower spikes were munched in half. So they only had sort of a couple of little somewhat unhappy flowers on each spike, which they should have had beautiful luck. So do keep your eye on slugs and snails in spring. And then I suppose last thing to talk about is lights. Now, where these grow in their misty, fabulous mountainy environments in the Himalayas, um, they do have bright winters. So the summer is often quite humid and cloudy, and the winter can be a little brighter. So bright indirect light is a good rule of thumb, and perhaps a little brighter in winter, but no direct sunlight. So I'm not sure if there are any selogenies, perhaps there are, but I think generally as a rule, selogenies do not fare well with really bright or direct light. So mine doesn't get any direct light, but it gets bright filtered light. And by a fluke of where it is, it is a little bit brighter in winter. So there you go. 
a little bit like a lot of dendrobium species that um, they need brighter light in winter so particularly things that come from deciduous forests the light is just obviously much brighter and that's what's going to trigger and prompt really great flowering for you okay i'm actually smelling more orange now maybe as the flowers mature i'm going to get more of a fragrance hmm the other thing is too that flowers that are white uh, species flowers that are white not hybrids are often pollinated by nighttime flying pollinators and so it can often be more fragrant at night i wonder i'll have to give this a good sniff in the evening and see if it is indeed an evening smeller there we are plant lovers Sologeny cristata i have got a little playlist of Sologenies actually so i'll add this to it um it is a beautiful plant and the flowers are just so elegant and sort of orchid-like. I know that sounds silly, but you know, if you were trying to imagine an orchid flower, then I think Sologeny flowers often look like them. Very, very beautiful. Only flowers once a year, so that is a bit of a bummer, isn't it? But never mind. Mine just sits hanging on the fence, doesn't take up any space. And I actually kind of find the foliage really attractive. So it's quite a, a beautiful plant. Well worth having a go at. If you're in a cooler climate like mine, they are super, super easy to grow. Just disregard the advice for keeping it dry in winter. And my advice would be to keep watering it in winter. I hope you've enjoyed that. I certainly have enjoyed showing you Sologeny Cristata. I do post every week, so hit subscribe and the notification bell if you want to hear my continuing adventures as they happen. I do post every Friday, and so I look forward very much to seeing you next Friday with another continuing adventure of my amateur orchid growing journey. Until then, take care, and I'll see you next week.